Tonight, in place of the program originally scheduled, a timely repeat of an interview of special interest. This is a case for rough justice. An eye for an eye. These people can't be hung, sir. They ought to be killed. M's eyes ceased to focus on Bond. For a moment, they were blank, looking inward. Then he slowly reached for the top drawer of his desk and extracted a thin file without the usual title across it and without the top-secret red star. He brought out a rubber stamp at a red ink pad. M opened the pad, tamped the rubber stamp on it, and then carefully pressed it down on the gray cover. He turned the docket round and pushed it gently across the desk to Bond. The red sans serif letters, still damp, said, For your eyes only. Silenced last week was one of the busiest and most successful typewriters of recent years when Ian Fleming, creator of James Bond, died in England at the age of 56 following a heart attack. After university, Fleming worked for Reuters News Agency as a foreign correspondent, then in banking, before joining British Naval Intelligence during the war. Afterwards, he was foreign editor of Kimsley Newspapers, with the contract which gave him two months off a year at Golden Eye, his house in Jamaica, where most of his writing was done and where the following interview took place. Ian Fleming's name first appeared on the bookstands in 1953 with the first of Bond's adventures, Casino Royale, which he had begun to write at the age of 44. After that, startling things happened. More than 32 million copies of his 14 books were sold, earning him a fortune of close to $3 million. 12 million copies in the United Kingdom. 15 million in the United States, where the late President Kennedy was an ardent James Bond fan. The Adventures of Bond appeared in 20 languages, including Finnish, Japanese, and Thai. The two have already been turned into immensely popular movies, and a third film is in production. During each annual two-month period at GoldenEye, Ian Fleming wrote a new book, 2,000 words in three hours every morning. Each one seemed to be assured of success. But was it, as some critics charged, because the books were heavily laced with sadism, savagery, and sex? Our interviewer asked Mr. Fleming how he reacted to these charges. Well, I don't mind very much. I expect the same thing happened to poor old Bulldog Drummond and the rest of them in that time. But um, the point really is that, particularly since the last war, we've all become much more educated in what really is uh, violence and, and, and sadism and savagery and so on. And it's ridiculous in these, this day and age to have one's hero hit over the head with a baseball bat, when in fact one knows what happens at Auschwitz and all these other places during the war, Belsen and so on, and what technical tricks of torture and violence the Gestapo got up to, what the KGB gets up to now in Russia, what happened in northern Africa with Algeria and Morocco with these total electrical devices they use on people. And so to, as I say, to use the old bulldog drum and baseball bat would be rather stupid. I mean, it just wouldn't be contemporary writing at all. As for sex, well, we've all got, I mean, sex is a perfectly respectable subject as far as Shakespeare is concerned, and um, I don't see why it shouldn't be as far as I'm concerned. In any case, I don't, I mean, I don't overdo it in any way that... Uh, no four-letter words or nonsense of that sort. Do you feel these are necessary items? I, I refer to the uh, sadism and sex. Uh, necessary items to sell thrillers? I don't think so, no. Of course, I don't admit to using sadism. I admit to using violence. But um, I think they're part of life. I mean, all history is, is uh, love and violence. And uh, I think it applies very, almost as much to uh, the great novels as it does to the normal thrillers, so to speak. But, of course, there are many different kinds of thriller writers and many different kinds of thrillers. And I just have my particular line of country. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about the, uh, the kind of novel that has uh, 
great sexual detail and an entirely promiscuous cast. Well, I must say, of course, I'm a certain age, so that the whole thing's rather stale news to me, but uh, uh, I think it's unnecessary, really. I think you can convey sex uh, without using raw words very much better than you can than by using them. And um, I personally think that this is only a phase that we're going through, and that the so-called sex novel, which you see so much of nowadays, will in fact go out of fashion before very long. I mean, people get, will simply get tired of the same old situations as they know anyway. You yourself referred to the fact that you don't use the Anglo-Saxon four-letter words. Uh, I take it you disapprove of that in literature? I suppose it's some streak of my Scottish Puritan forebears, but um, I don't like seeing them on the page somehow. I don't, I use quite a lot of them when I'm playing golf, for instance. But um, I personally don't like seeing them on the page, and I think they hold up the reader's uh, cursive interest in the, in the book, in a way. They sort of they say, oh, Lord, you know, what's that? And then maybe they go on, or maybe they throw the book aside. But I mean, I think it's a bad literary device, the use of four-letter words. Certain people are always criticizing novels with uh, uh, sex and violence in them on the basis that they're going to corrupt our youth. Uh, how do you feel about that? And I meant for uh, warm-blooded, heterosexual adults, you know, in beds and railway trains and aeroplanes. They're not meant for schoolboys. Uh, teenagers, presumably, are reading them, however. Oh, yes, they are, and I think they're enjoying them very much. My son hasn't yet got to read them. He's about 11 and a half. He thinks they're very dull. In one of the books, you have Bond referring to uh, his own basically dirty life. Yes, well, of course, spying is a dirty trade, and uh, we all know it. Khrushchev has said so, and so has Alan Dulles. And uh, we don't, uh, in England, we don't talk much about our secret service, but I know that we'd say the same thing if we were asked. But, of course, spying is, in fact, a dirty, dirty trade. I mean, so is uh, private detective work and uh, all that underworld of, of sort of policemanship is, is a dirty life, let's face it. And James Bond is engaged in a, in a dirty trade. Well, why do you think it, uh, a hero who engages in a dirty trade and leads a basically dirty life has become so popular with the uh, leading public? Well, um, it's very difficult to say. I think because perhaps the books have pace and plenty of action, and um, espionage is not regarded by the majority of the public as a dirty trade. They regard it rather as sort of a... Uh, a very romantic affair, you know, since the first days when the spy from the other side lifted up the tent flap and listened to the plans of the Arab chieftains and tried to get away with it. Spying has always been regarded as a very romantic one-man job, so to speak, one man against the whole police force or an army. Do we have a need? You would forgive this bird, but uh, in Jamaica we have these cling clings and they make this tremendous racket. Buzz off. <laughs> do, you, do you feel there's a need for uh, heroes, extravagant heroes like James Bond? Well, I think particularly today, this is the age of the anti-hero, and uh, everybody's trying to debunk the great. There's no reason that I can particularly see, but uh, they do so, and, and um, as you know, all these uh, satire, films, plays, television, radio, shows, uh, all over the world. They're trying to sort of knock down the idols, either of the present or the past. And, uh, of course, they'll end up by knocking, up, knocking down God if they go on as fast as they're going. And uh, I think this, is personally, is a great mistake because I've got many heroes in my life. I mean, people like Winston Churchill and heaven knows how many other people I've met during the war. And um, I think that, that uh, although they may have feet of clay, uh, we probably all have, and all human beings have, and uh, there's no point in dwelling entirely on the feet. There are many other parts of the animal that could be examined. And I think that people like to read about heroes. Mr. Fleming, in your books there's a great amount of detail two kinds of detail, um, sort of travelogue detail and uh, espionage detail. 
Is this detail based on personal experience? Uh, do you make it up? Where does it come from? Well, uh, I can say it's 90% from personal experience, really. I, mean, I wouldn't say the espionage detail is, because um, although I worked in naval intelligence during the war and got mixed up in a lot of shenanigans, uh, of course, I, if I started sticking too close to the espionage, true espionage work of today, I should be in trouble with the Official Secrets Act in England, even supposing I had access to information. So a lot of the espionage detail is either invented or taken from uh, very often cases which have uh, been brought between, let's say, the West Germans and the Russians, the KGB, uh, or incidents that have occurred all over the world in the espionage field. And of course, the whole battle goes on the whole time, so there's plenty of material available in that direction. As for the backgrounds, I try and... Um, I can't really write about anywhere that I haven't seen myself. Um, being basically a reporter by trade, I have got a, a good, strong visual sense for background and, and interesting detail and so on, which I try to bring into my books just in order to um, uh, make them seem more valid and truthful. And of course, if you're off on some tremendous plot with heaven knows what, James Bond in a hassle with some terrible villain, if, you, if he can use a Ronson lighter, let's say, or drive a Bentley motor car, or uh, stay in the Ritz Hotel, this all brings the reader back to Earth. You have mentioned that you were a newspaper man. Yeah. Yes, I started off in Reuters, the international news agency, at the age of about 23, and served with them for about four years in um, London and uh, Berlin and Moscow. I found I wasn't earning enough money in journalism, as I expect you probably find also. And I went into the city to try and make some more, and I wasn't very good in the city, and so I went back to the Times, actually, the London Times, uh, and got them to send me off to Moscow in 1939, um, just before the war broke out. It was actually in, the spring, in January or February of 1939. And um, then I served in Naval Intelligence as personal assistant to the director of Naval Intelligence throughout the war under two directors. And I had great fun. I went around the world twice and, and got involved in a lot of escapades, which were very exciting at the time. And after the war... What kind of uh, escapade? Well, actually, part of the main plot of my first book, Casino Royal, the gambling sequence where Bond outgambles a uh, Russian agent and bankrupts him, stemmed from something that happened to me on the first time I went with my director, Admiral Godfrey, to Washington in plain clothes before America came into the war. And we took the long route down in a flying boat down by Lisbon and um, Africa and then across to South America and up that way. And um, on our first night in Lisbon, we talked to some of our Secret Service chaps there, and of course they were interested in hearing our views and we were interested in hearing theirs because Lisbon was a great center of German espionage. And they said, well, if you want to see these uh, uh, agents of the Abwehr, as it was called then, you'll find most of them gambling in the casino at Estoril. And I suddenly had the brilliant idea that I would take on these Germans and strip them of their funds, thus making a small dent in the secret um, treasury of the Abwehr. So I sat down at the table and um, bonkered one of the Germans once and lost. And I bonkered him again, lost again, bonkered him for the third time, and I was cleaned out. So that wasn't a very successful exploit, but it was on the basis of this real-life episode that I based the big gambling scene in Casino Royal. And Bond actually repeated that, and was only saved by the American agent giving him money, wasn't That's it? That's right. <laughs> That's quite right. <laughs> Absolutely right. When you react to um, a place like, say, Paris, or when Bond reacts to Paris, do I take it that that is actually the way you felt about Paris? Uh, yes, it is. I gave Paris a bit of a pasting, I remember, in one of my short stories, and complained that it hadn't been the same thing since the war, since the occupation. 
And uh, all these observations are really, of course, observations of my own, which I've put into Bond's mouth or mind. In uh, w one or two of your books, you have some brief uh, descriptions of Canadian scenes. Now, I find that these tend to be much less colorful than your descriptions of other areas of the world. I'm wondering if this is because you have found Canada a colorless place. Well, I've been, no. The main reason is that I've been very little in Canada. I was there during the war two or three times on rather hasty missions of uh, naval intelligence work. But um, I simply haven't had a chance to, to, to visit Canada and visit the romantic parts of Canada. I mean, I can imagine that Toronto would make a tremendous locale for a gangster story, for instance, these days, from, from what I read in the newspapers. Oh, you but get I, the impression we have gangsters in Toronto, do not we? Well, I mean, that's simply what I read in the, in, in the English newspapers. But, um, I mean, I'm merely giving that as an example of, of a town that uh, undoubtedly, if I wished to set a gangster story in Toronto, it would be a suitable locale, presumably. In the books, you describe uh, little foibles of Bond, things he likes or dislikes, usually things he dislikes, um, things like tea yeah. and Windsor not. Mm. Are these your dislikes? Yes, they are. Yeah. Are you given to many and strong dislikes? I think so. They're sort of foibles, you know. But um, tea, I regard as fact of the downfall of the British Empire. And, and uh, tie of the winds or not, I find much too tidy. I think you know, it shows that the man is rather vain, I think, if he uses the winds or not to his tie. So I put these in. Uh, they're sort of, uh, they build up the, perhaps the character of, James Bond to a certain extent, and uh, I'm rather amused, of course, to put forward my own little quirks in prose. How did the Empire founder on tea? Well, I think because people are always drinking the damn stuff. I mean, I remember during the war, you know, sort of four o'clock came in the middle of some tremendous naval action, and then these bloody tea trolleys used to come rumbling down the corridors of the Admiralty, and somehow everybody used to stop work. I mean, that, that's an exaggeration. Mr. Fleming, how does an author tackle the problem of selecting a name for the hero of his stories? Well, it isn't only the hero. I mean, I generally pick up names just driving through the countryside, I, through villages and so on. You'll see an interesting name uh, over a tobacconist or a chemist or something of that sort in any country in the world. But um, when I started to write these books in 1952, I wanted to find um, a name which wouldn't have any of this a romantic uh, overtones like Peregrine Carruthers or whatever it might be. I wanted a really flat, quiet name. And one of my Bibles out here is uh, James Bond's Birds of the West Indies, which is a very famous uh, ornithological book indeed. And I thought, well, now, James Bond, now that's a pretty quiet name. And so I simply stole it and used it. Mr. Fleming, I appreciate that in any... Uh book, and particularly in a thriller, you need a villain. Um, you have a collective villain in most of yours, or a lot of yours, the Russians. Mm. Uh, do you really feel they are as bad as uh, you paint them? Well, the trouble is that, uh, as any thriller writer will tell you, the villain is a very difficult man to find anywhere, because if one's a fairly intelligent person, one knows that a villain really probably has a psychopathic background, if you paint him the psychopathic background, you immediately uh, make him uh, make the uh, reader rather sorry for him, make him a sick man, which of course most villains are. And um, the Russians have behaved in a very villainous way since the war, in many respects. I mean, it was only last year there was a case uh, brought against a Russian agent in Karlsruhe who confessed to having killed three West Germans with a cyanide water pistol, let's say water pistol full of cyanide, pure cyanide, which leaves no trace. He generally shot the man going up a staircase and uh, with this uh, spray, and the man fell down and instantly dead. And after a very short while, the cyanide fumes disappeared, and probably the autopsy said that he died of a heart attack climbing the stairs. And this man had been sent to kill the third man, or fourth man, I can't remember quite which, and his nerve broke, as it often does with killers, and he confessed. And he got seven or eight years and so on and so forth as a result of his confession. Now that's a very villainous act. 
And I'm afraid if the Russians go on with this sort of uh, joke, you know, I shall have to pursue them. But before the war, of course, the Germans were always set as the villains in our thrillers. And I think nearly all Bulldog Drummond's villains were Germans. But uh, I rather like the Russians. I worked there twice, and they are very great people, and um, I don't want to rag them too much. And maybe before long I should have pushed off towards China, but they're very, very great people too, and so I'm rather hard put to it. It's a very difficult thing to get these villains to grow on trees. Why do you say before long you may be pushed off towards China? Well, simply because I think that there's a tremendous uh, relaxation in Russia and that uh, the West and Russia, perhaps even this year, may get very much closer together. That's my feeling, just my nose. And um, if that is going to happen, if peace is going to break out, well, the last thing I want to do is to... Uh, uh, provide any hindrance to the process. When you say closer together, do you mean just closer together at the conference table, do you, or do you think there is a, a changing of uh, political ideas and ideals? Oh, I think there's a tremendous melting of the ice flow in, uh, flow in Russia itself. And I think they're moving towards uh, something like the brand of extreme socialism that uh, we have in the extreme left wing in England and elsewhere in Europe. And I think before long, we'll sort of all end up with sort of more or less the same brand of, of socialism. But, uh, I mean, that may be wishful thinking, but um, that's how I see the, the, the general pattern of history probably working out, because uh, certainly communism is breaking down in its machinery very badly, as we all know from the bad crop situation this year in Russia. And, um, of course, it may be a very long process, but... Uh, I can't help feeling that that is probably the way of history. I think, um, I mean, I personally don't believe there'll ever be an atomic war because I think war has gone out of fashion. This old business of killing millions and millions of people, either with one weapon or another, I think has become old-fashioned and um, may go completely out of, uh, cease to be a form of human activity altogether if everybody can become civilized at the same rate. But, of course, um, that is not possible, and we have a lot of, a lot of dangers that some lunatic like Castro or perhaps one of the new African states may suddenly get hold of nuclear weapons and start threatening the world and, you know, playing around with these things. And um, so what one's really got to do is to try and ensure that um, the climate of history moves equally all over the world. And let's hope the Chinese, for instance, will shortly the court by the infected by the general atmosphere, which I see. I don't know whether I'm right or not. You approve, I presume, of the uh, French trend now then to uh, recognize uh, Red China. Oh, yes, I think it's ridiculous. I mean, here is one of the greatest nations in the whole history of the world with, what, 500 million people? I mean, you can't just sort of wipe it off from that. But I think uh, with any luck, in a year or two, China will be a full-blooded member of the United Nations. And... Um, completely accepted as a member of the committee of our of, of nations. Which is, it's ridiculous, of course, that this huge vacuum should exist on the map, really. They're wonderful people. They may be politically misguided in our views, but uh, it doesn't mean that they aren't very fine people. A moment ago, you referred to um, Castro as a madman. With Cuba only 90 miles, right. miles away from you uh, here, um, is James Bond not afraid of uh, revolution being exported to Jamaica? Well, they're trying. I mean, in a way, they're, um, they're putting, off, putting over a great deal of um, revolutionary propaganda on the radio, as they are to all the Caribbean states and the Central American states. But the Jamaican, if he hears politics being talked on the radio, he's rather inclined to turn it off and get on to music. You know, he just doesn't really want anybody's politics. In one of your books, you referred to a cab driver born into the buyer's market of the welfare state in the age of the atomic bomb and space flight. For him, life was meaningless. This is a pretty gloomy view of the welfare state, etc. Well, I think it was an exaggeration. I described the young man as a bit of a beatnik. And um, I was trying to say, which I personally believe, that while the welfare state has brought us a lot of... Uh, very worthwhile dividends, particularly in 
shape of medicine and so on and so forth and the basic necessities of life, it has feather bedded the ordinary man in the street, to my mind, to too great an extent. I think this is recognized by politicians everywhere, but of course, once you start on welfare statism, it's very difficult to, to slow down the process. And when you get a chicken in every pot, then the next government has to offer a chicken and a half in every pot, and so on and so forth, and so it goes on. And I think it's rather inclined to, uh, to make everybody sort of uh, spectators rather than combatants, let's say, in sport and so on and so forth. They don't take part so much, they just go and spectate. And of course, with television and so on nowadays, with all due respect to you, people would rather kind of sit at home and not get out into the fresh air. But um, I think uh, nowadays a lot of people are rather inclined to sort of wander around and get bored. And boredom is the worst sin, of course, of the human being, really. I mean, it's the worst thing that can happen to him, boredom. Does this again then take us around to a reason for James Bond being so popular in that he always has a goal? I think it probably does in a way. I mean, his, um, his task is a straightforward one and he goes for it in a fairly straightforward fashion. And I think people like the action. Is it possible that one of these days we'll read a James Bond novel in which the hero is killed at the end? I couldn't possibly afford it. This interview was originally seen on the program The Sixties, last February. Well, for Bond, there may still be one new adventure. A thirteenth Bond story was left unfinished at the author's death, and it would hardly be surprising if the publishers found some way of having so valuable a property finished. So perhaps Agent 007 may yet turn his attention to the Chinese, and perhaps another hand will be able to do what Ian Fleming could not afford to do, and James Bond's adventures with a bullet. Well, next week at this time, the first of a new National Film Board series called Comparisons, which this year will compare life in Canada with that of Thailand and in Greece. <laughs>